was my teacher, really, in high school. He taught me in my senior year. And then I came back, I went to Hampton, and came back, you know, after several semesters, and met up with him. I can't even remember where we <laughs> saw each other. We just bumped into each other. I and I, and I really <laughs> didn't like him when he taught me. So <laughs> that's why I wondered. How did that's all this true. come about? I'm still trying to find out today. <laughs> What did I teach? English, language or arts. And sometimes when a teacher didn't show or they had a shortage, you would be put into some other position that you would uh, kind of go on. And then of course there were other things like bus duty. Someone had to take care of the bus drivers, so that was a part of my assignment too. Lang Hai. Uh -huh. Right, right down the road from here. Mm -hmm. Passed it on the way here on the... So Highway 17? Yeah, yes. no longer, uh -huh. no, no longer a school, the but school the building is still there. The building is still there. Right, right. Uh -huh. And what grades did it teach? I taught seventh and eighth grades for the most part. And I had taught in the, uh, I taught seniors. And whatever else is needed in between, but my main classes were seventh and eighth grades, and it was always language arts. My mom is Evelyn Jenkins Waring, and my dad, William Waring, Jr. And you? Also Charleston? Also Charleston? Yes. Well, not pleasant, really, not pleasant. Okay. but you know, um, when you say, where were you born? Well, you say Charleston, but, but really, we lived here in Mount Pleasant. William Essex Forsyth and Ruby Ethel Middleton Forsyth. Uh, both place of Ruby, Charleston, South Carolina. Birthplace for William, Jacksonville, Florida, I think. Okay. It's Florida, <laughs> I think Jacksonville. Okay. Any siblings? No siblings. Loner. So both of you only children? Only children. <laughs> She was stern, very loving, um, and some of the things that she taught me, the, the first thing that really comes to mind was that uh, when we first came over to Polis Island, my first days at Polis Island, I believe we, we came over around, uh, we came over after school, so it was summer. And my first image was getting up my first day and coming out, looking out, beautiful sunshine day, going into the kitchen uh, because I was following my nose, the bacon and, you know, <laughs> things being cooked, walked through the dining room, the table was all set. And I walked into the kitchen and I was thinking in my mind, Oh boy, I could sit down and I'll enjoy this breakfast. But as I walked into the kitchen, um, she said to me, Oh, I want you to take this uh, breakfast over to Miss Jordan. Miss Jordan was an old lady who lived on the premises at Paulie's. And it's uh, the location where the general purpose building is now. And there was a, an old um, house there, and she lived alone there. And she said to me, I want you to take this to Miss Jordan. And I think I stood up there for a couple of minutes and my mouth kind of hung open. And I said to Miss Jordan, uh, but, uh, and I was trying to say, but my breakfast is, you know, breakfast is ready. 
And she never looked my way again and went on humming, you know, uh, you know the, and these religious songs that she hummed, uh, she went on humming. And she didn't look my way again, she didn't pay me any attention. I was still standing up there. So I went ahead, she had it all fixed up. I went ahead, picked it up, and I went on to take it to Miss Jordan. I got over to Miss Jordan, and uh, Miss Jordan, you know, Miss Jordan spoke Gullah. Okay. And, uh, but I understood her. I, for some reason, I can understand Gullah, and I can speak it now, too. Um, but she said, oh, come on in. Oh, I thank you so much, you know, for food and everything. And so I gave her the food, and uh, I went on back. And I didn't say much to I didn't say much to my mother, but I always remember that because in later days I am thankful that she had me to do that because it um, kind of gave me uh, an understanding of selflessness versus selfishness. And I think had I not done that, I think I might have gone down another path, and I would have been a very selfish person. But today, I am not selfish, I'm selfless. Yeah. And that's the first thing that comes to mind, and it's a thought that always revolves back and forth. When I first saw her, but she was very, very polite, loving type. But I knew what Miss Ruby says and thinks. Miss Ruby really thought, and you know, that type person. She was going to bring the best out of you. Uh, I saw that right away, and she uh, wanted, well, of course, you know, um, my ideas and what I wanted and all of that was fine, and she'd listen, you know, attentively and all of that, but I do want you to know you're going to be the daughter-in-law, <laughs> and um, you're going to conform to many of my beliefs. <laughs> I knew that right away. <laughs> But we had a beautiful time together. I took care of her when she was sick, and that's just the way it goes. But she's a special person. I say she is, but I think she's still special, even though she's gone from us. Quiet. Uh, he's very loving. He was very loving. But he was uh, just a little bit on the quiet side, somewhat. Um, always stayed busy doing something. Had wonderful building skills that um, I recognized later. I, before, I think when the place was made at Paulie's, he built, he had a helper, but they built the garage, and you could not tell that they uh, were not carpenters who actually built it. And I often think of it today, and I, in my mind's eye, I will perhaps one day sketch what I uh, can remember of that garage, because it's something that, uh, you know, you say, well, I can divide that up, and I can stay in there. But it was a beautiful, a beautiful piece of work. Mm -hmm. I, um, my father didn't do a lot of driving. He didn't do any driving that I can remember at all. He walked everywhere that he had to go, or he was taken. We had a nurse who lived at the house, and uh, she was more or less our transportation for places that we had to go. Um, or he would walk, or he had a bicycle that he would ride when he needed the exercise. But he was always about something like that. He'd always see that we had a lot of food and whatever we needed for the house, he'd always see to it that that was there. Um, and we'd have it on hand before we really needed it, but if there was a possibility we would need it, it was there. And I often think of that right now as I, as I am compared 
with some of the way things used to be. Because my daughter would say, oh, you don't need two of those, you can go get that. But that wasn't the case then. <laughs> but I don't think she understands that. <laughs> It's not running down to the store. The store is about a mile and more from anything, at least a mile. Mm -hmm. He was such a simple person. He didn't have, want lavish things or any of that. Um, I always remember he drank out of a jar, a mason <laughs> jar. Mason jar. Okay. Uh -huh. Everything. And I, I don't mean a little tiny one. Yeah, no, no, he was he was really a tall person. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I always remember that about him, but he was always kind. Willing to sit down and listen to what you had to say. And willing to help you no matter who you are. Yeah, you know, it didn't matter to him. And he, and he never really strived to have, like I said, the lavish things, the big cows to this not like today. They were the ones who came to help and whatever it takes, even if it took something that he really needed and wanted, he would share it with someone else. I always remember that about Dad. We had a gentleman who was hitchhiking. Uh, he was either hitchhiking to Washington or New York, but he was from the West Indies, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere down there, and he stopped one day, um, and he came to the house, and he needed, he hadn't eaten, you know, uh, along the road, and he was still trying to get up to New York, so he was, he was given, he wanted uh, some place, he was trying to find, find some place to stay. So, um, Mother and Daddy kind of put their heads together and they said, well, we got a room up here. You're welcome to come in and spend the night and they give you food and everything. So he came in and they talked about things about, you know, where this man was from and his adventures along the way. And he ate supper with us or dinner and supper spent the night, ate breakfast, and they gave him some money to help him along his way, and it was goodbye. I always remember that man coming in here. Not, not typically the case today, mm -hmm. but um, that's what happened then. Well, I think that both of them were demanding that's the first thing. Daddy's teaching style was um, more or less following exactly what was down there in the book and you know you get the rules for math because his view was the math that he taught for the most part he took care of that and mother took care of the other things the social studies kinds of things. So there was usually a greater interaction between students in the social studies area than in the math area. Um, there would be a discussion, and one thing I remember about Daddy was that when he questioned students about things, and a little guy would say, "I think, I think, just like, what do you think about so and so?" I th Think just like Johnny think. <laughs> you say, what did Johnny think? <laughs> well, that guy ran into a brick wall, so then he would have to tell him, when I call on you, I want you to tell me what you think, not what Johnny thinks. So don't tell me that I think like he thinks. I want to know what you think. I, I always can remember that about him. <laughs> Mother would engage in, uh, you know, and they, we would uh, waltz around more or less with the answers and discussions. There was more discussion in Mother's classes than Daddy's classes. I, yeah. My elementary school was a long point. L-O-N-G-P-Y-N-T. 
a Long Point school. It was in our community, like I said, we, I always consider myself a country child and I still am. <laughs> this was just in me. And I believe it went to sixth grade. The building is there now and they are trying now to move it onto our community center property. If we could just get the funding to move it. My mom, grandma, and all of them went to that school before, you know, you had the, the high school right. and the junior and all of that. Okay. And then, of course, I went to Lang, where I met him. And then from Lang, I went to Hampton. At that time, it was Hampton Institute. And from there, I went to Chester, Pennsylvania, where I taught there. But I was in preschool. My daughter kind of followed along my lines oh, yeah. also. <laughs> Teachers were in the family. Mother was a teacher. Um, she was one of the first uh, black teachers over here in Mount Pleasant, by the way. Um, but mother was a teacher. My aunt was a teacher. And daddy was responsible for teaching over here. I went to, um, I had been away, and I came home. I, I had, um, I got drafted, and after uh, service, I came home, and I went to, when I say came home, I went to my aunt's house, really, because I spent the years from grades 9 through 12 in Charleston at, with my aunt, um, because we, I was going to attend Avery. I had been attending before I went to college, then I was going back to Avery. And Avery went through 12th grade, and Burke didn't go, Burke, they cut Burke to 11 grades or something, uh, and the Catholic school went to 12th grade. So I was going back to Avery. I stopped at my aunt's house when I came back from service. and. The day after I got there, she had been visited by the doctor. Uh, her husband had died while I was in service, and she was kind of ailing from this and that, and, uh, you know, uh, real or imagined. So before the doctor left, the doctor had been by to visit her. And I came in, and he uh, told me he wanted to talk to me before, you know, he left. So he talked to me and he told me that, you know, I think probably the real trouble with your aunt is that she doesn't have anybody to do anything for. <laughs> so, and um, if you could, now, and what were your plans? I said, well, I plan to go to Washington. He said, well, if you could spare a little of your time, uh, if you could just spend maybe two, three weeks or so, uh, you know, longer, uh, that would be good. And I think it would, you would see some improvement in her condition. So I said, well, yeah, we can do that. So I decided I'd stay the couple of weeks, so two weeks went into two months, and then she, uh, mentioned to me about um, teachers. You know, we got a shortage of male teachers. And uh, I know the supervisor has been trying to find out if anybody knew of any prospective teachers. <laughs> so the um, supervisor got in touch with me, and I got on the substitute list some of the schools that I went to, they would take me to meetings in Columbia. And I went to uh, a meeting, and they said that they were going to have this teacher's exam. So my wife said, well, go ahead and take the teacher's exam. Now, the teacher's exam was given the day after we had Mardi Gras at uh, Charleston. And I was on the Mardi Gras. I think I was on that committee. 
And I stayed at the Mardi Gras. So came in about two o'clock or so in the morning. And uh, the, the teacher's meeting, I mean, the teacher's exam was given about eight o'clock. So I went on, got up, prepared myself at eight o'clock, hyped up, went on, took the exam, and uh, went on back home, didn't think about it too much. And then we got a notice, and my heart opened. She said, oh, you got a knee on the exam. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I don't know if she called the supervisor or, uh, or whether the supervisor had a listing or whatever. But anyway, I had the day that I got the job, I had three job offers the same day. I had one across the Ashley and I had one over here. And I had another job in the city, uh, another type job. But um, I had to decide whether to take a job over here in Mount Pleasant or over on Jones Island. And for some reason, I selected Mount Pleasant. And that's what happened. My aunt would fuss with me from that day until she died. She didn't know why I took a job over here in Mount Pleasant because we had that bridge there that went like that, you know. And she said, anybody who would want to go across that bridge two times in one day must be crazy. <laughs> but I did. I, I got hung up on that bridge one night until about two o'clock as there was a wreck. And I said, yeah, see, that's what I'm telling you about that bridge. But I enjoyed every moment of it. I enjoy teaching over here. How many years did you teach? About 28 or 29, something like that. We were preparing to eat breakfast, and all of a sudden, somebody, we heard somebody hollering, Hey, Miss Ruby, Miss Ruby, we're in Forsyth. And uh, she jumped up immediately and ran up and looked, yes, yes. So they said, uh, somebody, somebody trying to drag that girl down to the marsh. So she went down, went down like the Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. And uh, Daddy ran into the room. He got his gun. And I ran over in the corner and got my BB gun. <laughs> and we, we all went one, two, three. But Mother was already ahead of us when we got there. I was fine there. And we got down there. And we got to the marsh. And here comes Mother walking around the edge of the marsh with a hand and the back belt of somebody marching them out of the marsh. And uh, the girl had. Uh, was up there with the other little girl who had reported it. And he said um, they, the guy was supposed to have been trying to rape the little girl and drag her into the foot. And the guy looked like he was confused. And I often think, I said, this guy must have thought my mother was crazy. <laughs> so this is a crazy woman. And she got me by the back of my foot. And um, so he waited up there until the sheriff came and got him. <laughs> now, a lot of people um, uh, that were related to the guy, they stopped speaking because that, that's my kinfolk. Yeah. And I can remember that about her. I often remember that tale about her. There was one that I was involved with. Uh, we were through with a Friday and we were through with classes so we were raking leaves waiting uh, for the other class to get out raking leaves and we had a hole that we were going to put them in and bury them and um, uh, she told us now I want you boys to rake the leaves and I don't want you playing out here um, and I don't want you, I don't want you playing out here. all right 
So we went ahead raking leaves and sweeping them up. There was one boy, his mother was a teacher at the school. He was raking leaves. So this boy had nothing to do but come around and take the broom and hit me. And then he'd run and oh, he got such laughter from them. And I would tell him, okay, stop now. We're not supposed to be doing that. And I'd go on. And he would do it again. And the head told you to stop. And when he came the third time, I swung around and whopped him with the broom and knocked him into the hole. And he was so embarrassed, he got up, <laughs> he got up crying, and he started going. And then his mother came to the door and said, who bothered my child out there? You know, and by that time, mother heard and she came out. She said, oh, I'll handle this. So the lady went on back in the room. So mother came over and she wanted to know, didn't I tell you all not to do that? Didn't I tell you not to play? We were not playing. He did so and so. And all the kids, the little boys were around and telling her, no, it's his fault. He did so and so. She said, well, I told you not to play and you should have told me. So I was the culprit. So I got a, I got a spank in that day. It was good. But I tell you this, I was a mad mister that day. <laughs> I was a mad mister that day. So when it was time to eat dinner, I went in the room and closed the door. And uh, she said, it's time for dinner. I said, I don't want any dinner. <laughs> so of course, that didn't last too long. She <laughs> opened the door and said, well, you don't have to eat dinner. Come sit at the table. <laughs> and that was... That was too tempting. I sat at the table while everybody else was eating. So I found myself eating dinner. <laughs> and that kind of passed away. But I was, I was, I figured I was just, and I kept telling her, I, we, we discussed that afterwards. I said, I told you that I was not the guilty person. I said, yeah, but I told you uh, what the rules were. So even though you're not always the guilty, you're not always the guilty person, you uh, follow the rules. <laughs> and uh, I understood what she was saying. I mean, you know, it brought some understanding. But I always uh, kind of felt, look, I, <laughs> I was done wrong, you know, that's the way I just carried that around. <laughs> I can remember. Um, I believe it was around the time that he might have had Dad's death or something. And there, you know, I was really hot, I mean, really heartbroken when he died. And I thought, well, you know, I'm the daughter-in-law and I really wanted to do things, you know, just for him, for his sake, you know, just in the memory and all of that. And the one thing I really wanted to do was to keep the books and the, not books, but Whatever had happened, you know, we keep a little accounting of it for her and all of that. And she, I, 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 I knew that she wasn't all hopped up on it, but you know, I guess she says, well, I'll, I'll go along with this <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so my, I mean, I was just elated and here I am doing it and taking this one and reading this one and doing all of those things and had it all on paper and all of this. I think about a day or two, maybe three days later, I found that she had done her own thing. <laughs> she was just pleasing me. <laughs> I have often thought about that. And then I think that's the only time I approached my mom, my mother, Lord. She looked and she looked at, the, at my face and she knew I was hurt by that. And then I, maybe that's the day that we really, really became good friends and the future was going to come where I'm going to have to be the one to take care of her and all of that. The usual bacon and eggs, uh, sometimes toast, pancakes, and sometimes like a man might have steak and gravy and for breakfast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
Uh, for dinner, you'd have the same kind of things, pork chop, steak, uh, beans, greens, mm -hmm. cabbage, all those things. Always had vegetables. Um, supper. Supper was um, usually a sandwich or something like that. Sometimes a slice of watermelon, uh, cantaloupe. She used to have a knack for making excellent ice cream. And if today, if she were alive today, I could put some ice cream that she mixed and that I churned, because I was a churner. Uh, but if I were to put that beside some of the um, bluebell ice cream, which I consider to be about the best, mm -hmm. if I put them side by side, you'd never tell the difference. You could never tell the difference. i tell you something else that, uh, about a, that I do remember, too. On the day that she died, uh, about five o'clock in the morning, she called all of us. And we had no idea why, but she called us all to her room. And she began to tell us how much of a pleasure it had been to be with us, and how she thanked us for taking care of her. And uh, we still had no reason why. Now, I had a job teaching at the Navy Yard, teaching sailors. And I went on to work, because I think that was um, about 9 o'clock, about 10 o'clock that I had a class. And I went on down, I went on there, and uh, some of the kids were in school. But I was in class, I think class started about 10 o'clock and about 10.30 or something, 11, somebody came down and uh, told me that I had a telephone call at the office. I went to the office and they told me that I needed to come home. And uh, when I got home, I found that she had passed. <laughs> but we all, all, we always tried to figure out, how did she know? <laughs> I don't know, but she knew. She knew. One of those things. Yes, they did stress education. I think even at that time, we were young, mm -hmm. you know, young people. But I think we kind of knew and could see that if you had some education, you were going to probably be a better person. I mean, at that, you know, when you're young like that, you can't really, you know, grasp all of what education can do for you. Mm -hmm. But I believe that's where it started for me. It was not not the best of the times for us because we didn't, we weren't exposed to the kinds of things that the other children were. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I walked probably two miles or more to get to school. I know Burns doesn't know anything about that because he's a city boy. <laughs> but I'm a country girl. And I can tell you the things that we really, um, you know, had to just 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 be comfortable with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. But you did the best you can, and they did. Those teachers really did. I never will forget them. There were uh, teachers who were really, you know, who really pushed us. Down in early grades, I know that there was a teacher who showed us some of the things to do. I remember waltzing with her one day uh, because she was trying to teach us how to waltz, you know, and these were wonderful experiences where we had um, the teacher who dwelt on how to write a journalism teacher. We had an English teacher, um, and we were very impressed with her. And I had a couple of young teachers. Um, one's name was Cleoban, and he went to Howard, and, um, you know, he, <laughs> he kind of excited us about, uh, you know, the city of Washington and everything, and Howard. None of them excited us like 
Haven did with Howard, you know, and mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. the place to be. And that's not, <laughs> yes. that's not what he did, he absolutely did. It seems that what has followed her around was that when there's a task, don't look at it and say that I can't do that. Uh, look at it and say, I'll try. I'll, I, I might be able to do that, I should be able to do that. But I'll try, I'll give it a try. But uh, do that. Don't say I can't before you even try. It, his was more, don't follow the crowd, do your own thinking. And uh, it's not that you're going to do something because he did it or, or it's the same thing just, you know, to keep from mm -hmm. having to think to say, well, I'll do what he say, you know, I've, that was always his thing. Do your own thinking and <laughs> don't follow the crowd, be your own person. They didn't really need to have flashy or be flashy at all in order to influence someone else and to help someone else to climb the ladder. It's not like today where I'm the leader and then I have it all, you know, first and then I'll help you to come up later. They stayed at the bottom of the ladder, it didn't okay. matter to them. Mm -hmm. And then they helped to push you up the ladder. And I just don't see that anymore. Okay. You just don't see. But they were special for that.